Let us now look at 2D objects. So these can be useful to represent a number of different items within Mastering. Uh, so they can think of different structural elements that they could represent. It could be floors, it could be walls, it could be slabs. You know, the list goes on, but we're just using some of the more common structural engineering focused ones. Panel elements can also be used to represent uh, diaphragms or surface effects. And there's different types of 2D elements. So we have panel elements, which we've seen a little bit of already. We have diaphragm elements, which we'll be looking at in this exercise. And we have 2D finite elements, which is kind of a general term that may not be technically correct, but it's used for um, representing things like shells, panel, or sorry, shells, plates, or membranes. So panels have several different purposes, and we've seen some of them already. Uh, we looked at defining panels to represent the extents and span uh, definitions of an area load. There's an example of one right there where we can see the tributary areas. They can also be used to define the joints included in a diaphragm constraint, and that's actually what we'll be looking at within this next exercise we're going to do. Uh, we're going to look at applying diaphragms to our model. Another option is that we can use panels to define the extents and properties of a finite element mesh. So a panel can be used to basically draw the greater area, which will then be meshed with shell elements or plate or membrane elements to represent the stiffness and mass of a certain element or object. So we're going to look into an example here where we actually already have a model started. Uh, so this is a more complex model than what we've seen so far with most of the examples we've gone through. Uh, but we're really just going to keep it fairly high level. It's got a number of different groups to represent different aspects of the model. So we have groups for columns, for the braces and the beams. We have each floor separated into its own group as well, and as well all the different frames. So it makes it very easy for us to jump around and look at different components without adjusting the rest of the model. We also have a couple of low cases already defined for us. So if I look at the entire structure here, I selected my structure from this my structure dialog. I have a unit low case, and let me just display the properties if I can as well. So we have a unit low case which is defined with area loads with a magnitude of one kPa. We have dead low case with three kPa magnitude, and a live load low case which has five kPa, all applied in the vertical z direction as area loads. Now we're going to create a new load combination. So go to edit, load combination. And I'm just going to create a load combination here uh, that we can use to factor these loads together. So go 1.25 dead plus 1.5 live. And within this here, I'm going to do, use the dead load with a factor of 1.25, as I mentioned, and the live load with a factor of 1.5. I should also mention that this dialog can be accessed with a much bigger format if we go to the spreadsheet window. We'll look into that more later on. For now, though, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just run a linear static analysis now that I've created this load combination. So I'll go Analyze. And let's run a linear static analysis for both low cases and combinations. We can see that we get a clean solution for the analysis of our three low cases and our one low combination. And now what I'm showing right now is our member loads. This is for our live load low case. Maybe I want to switch to a different one. What I'll do is I'll actually switch to the unit load low case, and we can see what a unit load is producing. So this is one kPa. It kind of gives us an idea of the tributary areas for the members. And what may be more interesting here, I'll toggle off this display for now, is we'll just look at um, one particular store uh, floor here. So I'm just going to look at uh, maybe floor number three for now. And I'm going to toggle on this display of this tool here. It 
It's called the folder display of free body forces. So if I left click on this tool, I can just actually hide the rest of the objects so I can see it a little bit better. And if I display the actual legend, this is going to show me basically the forces uh, applied to this particular floor. So this is a total load on the floor for that unit load case, which counts the area. And what this means here is that each one of these reaction loads is the tributary area for that particular column because it's a unit load. So that's an interesting use of the free body forces tool, which is basically just giving you the reactions for the joints within that selected object set. So again, how I did that was I found the tributary area by opening that floor folder. In this case here, this is floor number three. And I toggled off the member loads uh, just to help with the view of everything. And then I used the free body forces tool just down here. Now let us take this a step further and we're gonna start adding some lateral loads since we don't have any of those in our model yet. I'm gonna to go to the loads window and I'm gonna to go to edit, load combinations. And I'm actually gonna add lateral loads based off of the forces within my load combination. Based on these vertical loads here, we know what the base shears are in the vertical direction and we can use a factor of that to apply it laterally as a notional load. So I'm gonna apply a notional load factor of 0 0.005 in the X and Y directions. And basically what this is doing is it's inducing some lateral loads due to the reality of the fact that in the construction world, uh, it's very unlikely that we're gonna have a perfectly vertical column, let's say. There's gonna be some out of plumbness, some lack of geometric perfection. Uh, and this helps us just represent that uh, because those sorts of imperfections can induce some lateral loads that we may not be accounting for in our analysis model. We could also create these notional loads in its own load case. I'm gonna do it this way under the edit load combinations dialog in the X and Y direction. And if we wanna do it uh, creating its own load case, we go to edit and we go generate notional loads. That's the other option. Now let's reanalyze this guy. You go to analyze, run a linear static analysis, And we can see we get a clean solution once again. And if I look at the whole structure, first of all, for my load combination, that's what I'm interested in right now, I want to look at the reactions tool. And I can see here that it's calculating the shear Z reaction, which is basically the, the amount of force that the ground is pushing back up on the model due to the applied loads. And this is how it's determining these shear X and Y. These are the notional loads that are a percentage of the shear Z value applied in the X and Y. Now, if I were to look at just the top floor, for example, I wanna look at floor number three. And more specifically, I wanna look at the deflections. I can see that the deflections look a little bit strange to me. I can look at the numerical values and I can see that we actually do have some issues with our deflections being very high at certain locations. So I have about 30,000 millimeters displacement. Really, that's an unrealistic amount um, that we wouldn't expect to see. Now, if we look at the releases in the members here, if I toggle on display of the releases, we can see that they're all simply supported beams. So really, we're only relying on the torsional fixity within these members to prevent any movement. And that's where we might want to consider using a diaphragm. Diaphragms can be defined using the panel element tool. So if I go to the geometry window, and I'll go to uh, the panel element tool, you can see that I'm currently using area load member or area load only panels to represent uh, the floor systems, but we can actually change these to rigid diaphragm panels. I left click and drag, change into rigid diaphragm panels. I just selected the rigid diaphragm option here by left clicking the name, or I could have chosen, chosen the type here from this dropdown list. We don't need to necessarily enter thickness or material. It's still gonna do all the area load traits that we wanted it to do. Uh, but what it's gonna do now is it's gonna constrain all the joints within each panel to act as a rigid set essentially. They're not going to be able to move closer to one another in the x or y axis of the panel or the rotate to independently of one another with respect to the 
global z-axis. That's how the rigid diaphragms work. And if we run the analysis, I can see the linear static analysis that we're running here is going to give us some different behaviors. So I'm just going to quickly jump into the results, specifically for the top floor. I'll toggle off the display of releases. And now I can see that we're getting much different looking results than what we had before. More in line with what we'd expect, you know, we're getting small deflections in the lateral directions, which we didn't apply much load anyway, so that should be expected. A couple notes about the rigid diaphragms, though, just to make sure we're all on the same page. They are rigid. There's no movement, no axle forces within the in-plane beams. There's no forces within the diaphragm. And when I say when there's no movement, I mean there's no movement of these joints with respect to one another. They're all gonna act as a rigid plane. Now, if we wanna load these panels laterally, we can apply loads or lump masses, but first we need to generate a node to load. And we can do that from the geometry window. Just so we're clear here, what I've done is I've actually just displayed which nodes are connected using this Verify Diaphragm Nodes button. That's where those pink lines come from. But getting back to what I was talking about earlier, we can generate a rigid diaphragm mass by going to Edit, Analytical Model, and then Generate Rigid Diaphragm Mass. Now in this situation, I haven't assigned a thickness or anything to my model or to my diaphragm, so it doesn't have a way of calculating the center of mass, but it's going to add this rigid diaphragm mass joint to the center of geometry. That's what this message is saying. And now we have this, let me select everything, these little red nodes here representing the rigid diaphragm mass joint. And if I just select those joints here, if I'm just going to use a selection tool and just select those joints, I can create a separate group for them. I'm just going to go new group and then I'm going to call it RDMJ, Rigid Diaphragm Match Joint. I'm going to update that group here with what I've got selected so that I can always refer back to it later on. And I'm going to create a new low case. This new low case here is just going to contain uh, some lateral loads. I'm going to call it X Static Seismic Loads. This is a simplified static analysis, uh, seismic static analysis, where we're not really going through the correct approach, but it's just showing you what it can look like. And I'm just going to assign joint loads in the x direction of 100 kilonewtons each. And they're going to be assigned to these three joints. And then if I analyze, I can see that I'm getting a clean solution once again. I have four low cases now. One thing I haven't really discussed yet is that right now my model is in some windows hiding the unselected objects with this happy face button. If I just toggle that off or on, I can see the rest of the model displayed just to be grayed out if it's unselected. But now I can select the whole model. I can look at reactions for whatever low case I'm interested in. So in this case here, I'll look at the X static seismic loads and see that I'm getting, not surprisingly, 300 kilonewtons of lateral loads here. Let me just show all my reactions. So I can see the base moments. Um, we'd be able to match these to our hand calculations if we wanted to. It's good to keep in mind that these are calculated uh, loads based on the global coordinate system origin, which is at this joint right here. So if you're looking to match the moments, that's what you'd have to use as your lever arm. So these vertical loads would impact your results. And this is why I guess it highlights the importance of a well-organized load case. We can also look at displacements on a group by group basis. So if I want to look at the displacement diagram, first of all, I'll turn off the display of my numerical values. And I want to look at a specific frame. Let's say in the X direction, I can look at X frame two. And I can see that in the right hand view and maybe I want to look at a front view or a side view, it might be more telling for this. We could look at actually uh, the lateral deflections in each one of these joints. So I want to look at these X deflections and see I'm getting about six millimeters in the top 
4.8 in the bottom or in the middle, 2.84 and so on. We can actually have SRAM calculate for us interstory drift as well, or story drifts. In order to do that, we just need to tell SRAM which story is which. So I can do that in the geometry window. Again, I'm just going to select the entire structure and I can use the floor numbers tool. If I left click on the floor numbers tool, it allows me to specify which joints belong to which floor. So I can tell it to auto find a joint in the Z plane. So any joint I click on, it will sign every single joint that shares that same Z plane with the same floor ID. Now it's important when we're doing this that we must define these sequentially with no gaps. We've got to start at floor number one and work our way up. So I'll go with floor number one, left click here, and it's going to fly, assign number one to every single joint in that floor at that elevation. And I'll do the same thing for floor two, floor three, and floor four at the top. And you can see it's assigned that to every single joint that it finds at that same Z coordinate. Then I'm going to click Analyze once again. Let's quickly go through this process. And graphically, we're not going to really notice much of a difference once we add those floor IDs. But if we go to the numerical results window, this is where we can see some more details. First of all, we can see our base shears and everything here as well. But now that we've added those floor IDs, we can look at the interstory drift spreadsheet and we can see, first of all, how much drift we have at each story height and also the percent of story drift as well. So we can see what the percent of story drift is as we go up our specific uh, height of our building. 